Welcome everyone to our, our Tech Tuesday webinar. Today, we're gonna to be talking about um, digital transformation, um, but we're gonna take a slightly different perspective on things. I think you'll, you'll find people talk a lot about modernizing our apps or you know, uh, in more recent times, it's been about the collaboration and maybe the, uh, the enterprise, but we're gonna talk about AppSec and, and why when you're considering uh, going through a digital transformation that you should be considering uh, you know, making updates to your application security um, sort of uh, platform or or strategy. Um, there we go. Um, just to introduce ourselves a little bit, um, my name is Andrew Horgan. I'm a technical PMM at uh, Deep Factor. Uh, I've been here for I think almost almost six months now. It's rounding up, um, but been here for for a little bit, learning all about AppSec and helping kind of spread the the message around Deep Factor. Um, I'm joined today by Karen. Karen, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hey guys, I'm Kiran Kamiti. I'm the founder CEO of Deep Factor, uh, addicted entrepreneur, lots of experience in the cloud native and other uh, areas. I was at Cisco before and uh, the bug bit me and I started a, uh, another company. Um, and this is an area that uh, we feel um, is going through a lot of change as organizations are creating cl uh, cloud native, containerized applications, Kubernetes applications, et cetera. And it's important to identify the security risks in these applications, um, you know, during the course of development, as opposed to late in the game uh, when the apps get rolled out into production. So, um, you know, hence, hence a modern take on an application security platform. Yep, absolutely. And and just a little bit about Deep Factor. We were founded in 2019. Um, we've got people from all over the sort of uh, technical sphere, uh, from you know. Uh, infrastructure and cloud native guys like myself, um, all the way to security experts from, you know, Qualys and Citrix, et cetera. So we've got a, a good, uh, well-rounded team and, you know, our mission ultimately is to, you know, help developers ship secure and compliant applications, right? That's, 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 if we could deliver one thing, that's what we want to deliver. So moving forward a little bit, I want to give Kieran kind of an opportunity to talk a little bit about the, you know, AppSec challenges and trends that we're kind of seeing uh, kind of shape up the environment here. Yeah, I mean, as, as many of you guys probably are following um, or have been following the space for quite a bit, which is probably what led you to, to attend this webinar, digital transformation is, uh, has been happening for the last you know, few years now, ever since cloud native applications started becoming the way you build modern applications. Um, that, has, um, that has resulted in, there, there's a couple of, we're sitting in, in the intersection of a few interesting trends. Number one is, Every organization, when they're building new applications, they're looking to now think about, should I build a new application using containers? In fact, that's kind of become the norm for any kind of high scale application um, with Kubernetes uh, or containers or at the minimum, maybe some serverless functions uh, being thrown there. So, so application modernization, if you're starting application building from scratch, then you know, cloud native izing your application seems like the way to go uh, these days. But if you're a larger organization that already has a bunch of applications in place and you want to try to uh, you know, transform those applications and modernize those applications and make them cloud native, then that's another um, you know, thread of initiatives that is happening in, in pretty much every large company that we've, uh, we've been talking to. So basically apps are getting more granular, they're moving at a faster pace because you want to ship them faster, you're putting them through your DevOps pipeline. At the same time, the number of security related uh, breaches, both in terms of the size of breach as well as the number of breaches have increased quite um, rapidly over the last few years. And uh, that number you know, we only see is gonna to continue to grow because the number of the applications um, are increasing quite heavily. So if you think about the uh, concerns around security, I mean, you have, you, you see stats uh, from uh, StackRock's adoption survey and, and some of the Red Hat uh, state of Kubernetes security reports. Um, they indicate, you know, that pretty much every Kubernetes deployment, 94% of Kubernetes, uh, you know, uh, uh, deployments have experienced security incidents uh, and, um, or they have experienced security related delays where issues were caught, but they were caught late in the game, which resulted in uh, releases getting delayed um, because somebody had to come back in, the engineering team had to context switch and fix those security issues, et cetera. Um, several of those issues are ops related, but there's also several of those issues that are application or development related. Uh, if it's an ops related issue, you you know the fix is to kind of um, you know, put, uh, protect your perimeter or you know get your cloud uh, security uh, posture configured right. But if it's the application, then the best way is to make sure that you create a secure application to begin with. Um, there was a, I was just attending a, another talk lately with somebody from Zscaler and they, they basically were saying, 
um, you know, do you want to be a coconut or an avocado? You know, coconut being, you know, secure outside, but soft inside with, without much uh, kind of uh, security inside. Um, that's important because you still need to have some kind of perimeter protection, et cetera. However, it's becoming more and more important these days as apps become, uh, you know, more granular and there's a lot more east-west traffic to be for your applicate for your organization security strategy to be an avocado, which is, you know, make sure that your application is secure in the, in the, in the middle, because once your app is secure, then, uh, then the rest of the things uh, start mattering a little less. And some other interesting stats here is in terms of the number of developers versus security professionals out there. So uh, the number today is 26 million. I think today we have about 26 million developers uh, and that number is supposed to get to 45 million by 2030. And um, the mind blowing stat that I heard is that there's gonna be 500 million cloud native applications by 2023. And come to think of it, cloud native and Kubernetes just got started five, six years ago. So this is like a, a, a massive amount of growth and proliferation in terms of the number of applications being uh, designed with cloud native in mind. At the same time, if you look at the number of security related um, you know, people, the talent pool is very small. And uh, uh, look at three and, a, three and a half million plus unfulfilled cybersecurity jobs. So it's important to make sure that you automate a lot of these cybersecurity functions during the course of your uh, dev or CI pipeline or in production so that you can make sure that you create secure applications to begin with. So what is driving, um, now that we've taken a look at the macro landscape, let's dig a little bit deeper. What is driving app sec modernization? We talked about app modernization, meaning containers and Kubernetes and, and serverless and all of these things that are creating, that are, that are enabling people to create secure applications. Now, how does that affect application security? Application security in this case being defined as the ability to identify all of your security and compliance risks during the course of your development. And we've talked to over a hundred enterprises over the course of the last year, year and a half. And we've broken it down into five themes uh, where these companies kind of come to us and, and, and say, um, this is the problem we're trying to solve and therefore we need a better AppSec solution. Number one of that is app modernization where somebody is creating an application or trans transitioning from a monolithic application into Kubernetes or, or uh, some kind of microservices based application. And they want an app sec platform that understands Kubernetes that is designed for Kubernetes. So they view this as an opportunity to say, you know, now that I'm modernizing my application, you know, I don't want to take all of the baggage of the older app sec tooling into this new world because I had put together a hodgepodge of five different app sec tools um, as part of, you know, in my, in, for my legacy application. I don't want to carry the same things forward. I, you know, is there a cloud native applica cloud native centric application security solution? Um, number two is um, DevSecOps adoption. I want to make sure that I add security early on in my CI CD pipeline so that we can identify the risks in, in the application before they're widely deployed into production um, or even canary rolled out into, your, into a smaller group of your, into your production. The third one is around alert fatigue that results in release velocity, uh, that affects release velocity. It's the, my current AppSec tools are giving me too many alerts and I don't know which ones of those I need to start fixing first. Uh, because of that, either we're fixing too many things which is affecting release velocity or my developers are just losing interest in work in, or the confidence in that tool. The, the fourth one we see is, you know, I have tools, tool fatigue. I mean, there's, there's just too many tools to use. And all of them are important because security at the end of the day is a layers game. But, you know, I don't, I as an organization don't have the people or the budget in my organization to kind of put a SAST, a software composition analysis, a container image scanning, a DAST and an IS. So there's just too many tools out there. Like, how do you, how do you simplify this? And lastly, is there, I, you know, given the, the importance of, um, of observing an application at runtime, especially for cloud native applications, because imagine your app, which was basically one thing, was broken down into like maybe you know ten plus containers now, and all of these microservices are being orchestrated up and down in in, in your you know uh, Kubernetes uh, or other environments, and you need visibility. The, the true security posture and risk of your application cannot just be assessed by scanning your code or scanning your um, you know artifact of containers but you have to actually observe what your application is doing at runtime because maybe it has some, it's passing some clear text uh, secrets and, uh, you know, at runtime, or maybe there's an environment variable that has a key in it. Lots of interesting things that show up only at runtime that you cannot just get by looking at your, um, your uh, static code or, or even your you know, container image scanning. So these are the five reasons why people reach out to us um, and uh, why uh, there's a need to rethink AppSec and create a next generation application security platform. Um, you know, and, and that's basically the, the course of this discussion today. Yep. 
And, and one of the things that we like to do when we give this presentation is kind of ask the audience, you know, where or, you know, what are the driving factors for them? Um, you know, obviously, I think for each of you, there's going to be an individual reason why this, uh, you know, this webinar was of interest to you. And so we're, you know, just wanted to do a quick poll. I think Virginia is going to go ahead and launch that in the background. Um, so you should see a pop up. But, you know, let's just take a quick second to answer this and, and just to, you know, understand where you guys are coming from. Are you, you know, like Kieran said, are you looking to modernize your application and you realize, you know, maybe this is the right opportunity to reevaluate my AppSec tooling? Are you concerned about release velocity and being able to allow developers to secure more quickly, but also ship at the same rate? You know, um, just take a quick second to, off, uh, to, to, to make a selection. I believe you can select more than one. So I'm just curious to see, um, you know, what, what you guys are saying. And uh, Virginia, I know you're uh, you're on mute and off camera, but I think you'll see the results if you could maybe um, uh, you know let one of us know what what seems to be trending um, more popularly than the the others. That'd be yeah, great. absolutely. So uh, as of right now, it looks like seventy five percent AppSec moder application modernization, with a second uh, runner up being Unified AppSec. Great, thank you. And that that kind of jives with I think the, the conversations that we have, right? It's it's you're you're going through this modernization, you're realizing that you're kind of towing all this stuff behind you, a lot of legacy, maybe more traditional ways of doing AppSec, and you realize this is an opportunity to maybe reevaluate it. Um, and then obviously while you're reevaluating, um, I think a lot of uh, vendors in this space have have kind of started to consolidate and unify and and really bring together a lot of legacy AppSec platforms so you can kind of get that best of breed approach. Um, and so that kind of jives. I don't care if you want to add anything else, but that 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 kind of makes sense, I think, from our perspective. Yeah, it totally does. I mean, people are frustrated with with a lot of tools that they have to put together because they want a good security comprehensive coverage at the same time without having to use too many tools. Number two is a tool that understands your modern application. So I think I'm I'm kind of um, pleased to see that both those are the two, um, number one, number two. Exactly, exactly. So before we get into you know the next generation of of AppSec tools, so to speak, um, what what we wanted to talk about a little bit was just kind of define the landscape as it stands today. And so you know th these uh, categories aren't you know they're not the categories, right? If you go look at a Gartner MQ, they're gonna maybe kind of realign it a little bit differently. But you know we kind of wanted to paint a picture of of the current AppSec landscape and and how we view uh, you know where these tools kind of fit best. And 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 this is kind of like a little bit of a one hundred and one you know. 202 type level um, for people who maybe are a little bit new to AppSec in general. Um, so on the left-hand side, you've got your, your static code scanners. Um, so these are things that are going to be looking at um, at your code as you're writing them. Um, you know, one of the more recently uh, announced sort of uh, capabilities is, is infrastructure as code. Um, the rise of Terraform and Pulumi have given the, you know, a rise to a need to secure your, your infrastructure code. Um, you know, a SAS, the static application security tester is going to be looking at the code that you write, right? So you're going to define best practices for your developers, for your organization. You're going to ensure that code is written to the, the sort of spec and, and quality and sort of uh, uh, framework that, that you expect within your organization. The other type of static uh, code uh, or static scanners that we have out there are um, SCA, so software composition analysis and container image scanning. So an SCA is going to be um, like, a, like a sneak. It's going to be observing, or, or not rather not observing, scanning your container images uh, in your artifact uh, repository. This is something that like a JFrog might do as well. And it's going to kind of help you understand all the potential vulnerabilities that that specific image might um, be susceptible to, right? So it's going to do some correlation. Some of them use their own, you know, their own databases. Um, some of them use like the the publicly available NIST CVEs, right? But the idea here is to understand as you start to pull in packages and dependencies, which of those are have pre-existing um, disclosed C uh, uh, CVEs. Um, same thing with container image scanning. So the idea here is that we're going to give you um, not only the vulnerabilities, but kind of a readout of all your dependencies and all the different packages that make up your, your application that will be deployed. In the dynamic category, we've got DAST. So DAST is dynamic application security testing. Um, there's a couple of different DAST, school, uh, DAST tools out on the market. You know, we at DeFactor really like OWASP, ZAP. But the idea here is that you are scanning all of the uh, APIs um, for your application, and you're checking things like the OWASP top 10. So uh, cross-site scripting, uh, SQL injections, um, uh, buffer overloads, et cetera. Those are all things that we're going to be scanning with uh, using a, a DAST. And then finally, we've got the runtime category. 
So what you see in runtime is uh, interactive AST. So um, you'll see I asked, you'll hear people say I asked a lot. Um, this is a, a fairly older, uh, I'll say uh, within the last two decades sort of technology. Um, it uses uh, an agent most, most commonly to observe the application as it's actually running. So the agents generally are a little bit, um, some developers would call them intrusive um, because you do have to actually compile them into your code, but they understand the language um, intimately, right? So you might have a Java engine agent that's going to actually understand all the different calls uh, and packages loads that your Java library is doing. Um, container sc uh, security scanning, or sorry, container security is a new category um, that's also in runtime. You'll often find these in production. Um, so you can think of like a, an Aqua or a Twist Lock, right? These are going to be um, sidecars that sit right next to your application and runtime. And they're gonna be observing sort of the network traffic that's going in and out of the cluster in between the pods. And it might do some sort of um, security analysis on that traffic. It might be able to isolate the pod. It might be able to give you insights into what the, what the uh, application is doing. Um, and, and when we talk to customers about the adoption of these various tools, what we have found is that there's four very clear stages when it comes to sort of DevSecOps maturity. So as you start to move um, left, as you start to shift the responsibility of security from the AppSec you know, silo, the AppSec BU within your organization, and you start to move it onto the developers, um, we're finding that various different enterprises are in different stages. So um, the first AppSec stage, uh, unfortunately, is actually a stage. We have had conversations. I, I went to uh, I went to lunch with a nonprofit, and the nonprofit doesn't do any AppSec, right? So they just release their code, they do some functionality testing, and they release it into the wild. Um, they're very early stage. They've only got a couple of uh, employees, so they don't really have the resources or the bandwidth to do AppSec, right? So they haven't implemented any tools. Um, more often than not, what we find. So a lot of customers are in this sort of like reactive AppSec stage where they are not really doing anything in the pipeline. They're not really securing their apps there. But what they are doing is once you know the app goes into production, maybe once every month or once every quarter, they do some sort of a pen test, right? They they contract out to an organization that specializes in, in AppSec and they go ahead and they do some, you know, some testing there. Now, obviously, the issue here is if you don't catch any of those security sort of um, you know, risks in the application until you've already gotten a prod, well, so can the bad actors, right? The bad actors have an opportunity to, to interface with your app just as much as the pen tester does. The other um, stage that we do see a, a lot of the larger enterprises for sure in are that, that sort of proactive app sec. So they realize that you can't just wait once a quarter to go ahead and do um, you know, a pen test. But what you can do is every time I build an image, I'm gonna do a container image scan. Uh, every single time I, uh, you know, maybe once a quarter or once a month, once a release, I'm gonna do a DAS scan to check my, my API security, right? So it's, it's, it's proactive at, at a minimum. It's, I'm not gonna wait until something goes wrong. I'm not gonna not do anything, but I'm gonna go ahead and do some of those stacks scannings. Um, I might have like a container security uh, product in play. So I might go into production and, you know, the ops team, the, the, the SREs, the, the DevOps team who are actually in charge of the environment, they might actually be doing some of the AppSec responsibilities. But, you know, not it's not really in the developer world yet. So the stage three is kind of the, the, the very beginning stage where you, you think, okay, in order for me to actually mitigate this stuff getting further into the pipeline, why don't I you know, have my developers start securing and observing the application um, before it gets um, put into production. And so that's what we call, call cloud native app stack. So the idea here is that your developers are, um, you know, as they're writing their code or doing their functionality tests, they're checking for security risks, they're checking for runtime behavior, they're doing their scans, all as part of that development process so that you don't necessarily need to go through stages one, two, and three in order to secure your application. And what we kind of advocate to customers is don't think that you have to go stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. You know, when I was having that conversation with the with the nonprofit, you know, I'm not going to advise that they slowly ramp up their AppSec capabilities. I'm going to say like, no, you should be looking at tools that are going to get you immediately from stage one all the way to stage four, right? Without having to go through those sort of baby steps to get into a you know a more secure uh, posture. So with, with that being said, what I wanted to do again is ask a second poll and, and just kind of get a feel in the room for where people are in their AppSec journey, um, you know, in their DevSec adoption journey. You know, are you someone who 
maybe doesn't take AppSec very uh, seriously today, um, or are you doing some out-of-band tests? Do you have static scanners? Are you, you know, more in a stage three sort of category, or do you really feel like you've gone the full mile and you're, you're doing cloud-native AppSec and you've you've got DevSecOps, um, you know, ready to go? So we'll take a, a couple seconds there, and, and Virginia, I'll ask you to speak up once again once uh, once you get some good responses. Sure. Uh, stage one is definitely in the lead at 42%, but stage three is coming up as a, a close second runner up. So yeah, stage one and stage three seem to be the most popular ones. Huh, I think that's, uh, I mean, we've done this a couple of times. I, I really feel like we usually get stage two and three. Stage one is surprising. Uh, I, I want to say shame, but that would be a little, <laughs> too, that would be a little too judgmental for this audience, but yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you, Virginia. Um, so you know, Karen, I, I know you wanted to talk a little bit now about um, what is the ideal AppSec tool. Yeah. Cool. So you know, we've established the fact. You know, over the last you know twenty minutes of this conversation, we've we've talked about the need for cloud native applications um, and a new breed of AppSec um, tooling. Now let's talk about what is that next gen AppSec tool look like. What is an ideal next gen AppSec tool? And I think, uh, given the context of cloud native applications, the number one important thing is that this AppSec tool should be easy to insert into your cloud native workloads, and it should observe both your running containers as well as your static container artifacts. So a cloud native first application security tool that is easy to drop into your Kube environments or other environments. It could even be like managed Kubernetes, like it could be AWS Fargate or even uh, your um, your own rancher clusters, for example, um, or um, and, and it should be able to watch both the uh, static aspect of your container images as well as the runtime aspect of your container images very easily. Number two is the um, number of alerts that you currently see with some of these legacy tools should be drastically reduced in order for your developers to take the output of these tools seriously. And one of the important ways to reduce that is by correlating some of your findings with what your application is actually doing at runtime. For example, an example is if you if your application has you know a hundred vulnerable uh, components that have CVEs in them uh, based on your software composition analysis or container image scan findings, can you look at which of those are actually used by your application at runtime? And by looking at that, you know you can reduce the number of alerts because you only focus on the libraries and the dependencies that have been loaded and used by your application. Therefore, your hundred might come down to twenty-five. Um, the other thing is uh, lack of runtime visibility uh, today is a problem, and a, a an AppSec uh, platform that uh, that understands not just the static artifact scanning aspect of it, but also runtime, like I talked about. The third one is the unified part, you know, which you guys chose in the poll is one of the problems, which is. You know, I don't want to be using too many tools. This one, uh, you know, or or a handful of AppSec tools uh, should be very easy to kind of uh, drop into my environment, and it should uh, get the various security insights in a simple pane of glass, or integrated even better as part of my CI pipeline. Like if I'm using Jenkins, you know, I, I should just be able to go, you know, do my standard builds, and at the end of the build, it should show me the, uh, you know, all of the things that matter with respect to bill of materials and the changes that have happened across releases all of the things that matter with respect to the security posture of the application, both static and runtime and compliance related insights. And if, if that can all happen as part of my CI pipeline, that would be awesome. So that would be in, you know, that is uh, the definition of what a next generation ideal AppSec tool should look like. And um, th there is an important aspect that of, of technology that has emerged over the last um, few years, uh, which is observability. And that is that is basically enabled us to observe running cloud native applications very deeply. So, um, you know, there's technologies like eBPF, there's sidecar technologies, there's also, um, you know, library loading uh, technologies that allow you to get deep visibility into your application behavior. And I, I want to make sure that we spend one slide talking about what observability is and how it has evolved and why it is relevant to AppSec and why it is important uh, it's an important fabric of creating the next generation AppSec platform. So what is observability? Observability is the method of evaluating running applications so that you can reach meaningful conclusions about their 
health, for performance, or in our case, application security. So far, um, all of these, uh, the first generation of observability products like Honeycomb, Elastic, and all of that, they've focused quite a bit on using observability for logs, metrics, tracing, like performance-related insights. But observability is just beginning to be used now to get application security insights. And um, you know, tools like Aqua or Sysdig or DeepFactor, uh, you know, these, are, these are some of the companies that are using observability to observe application behavior and then correlate that into security uh, related behavior. So what, it, what is it, why is it important for AppSec? Because it allows you to watch a, uh, an application or a cloud native application at runtime and then coordinate or correlate the behavior of the application with what is acceptable and what is not. Like a simple example could be your developer brought in some third party uh, code. They did not know that the third party code was making an outbound connection to a certain geography that you didn't want. Like let's just, for example, say, let's say Antarctica. Like it was making an outbound connection to Antarctica and you did not know. Uh, and uh, they did not know either because they, they thought it was a, a, a third party component that was already, that, that didn't show any CVEs in the scan. So, Many times runtime behaviors that bypass your scan, uh, your CVE list uh, because it's just, you know, the it was, it's not a known vulnerability, it's just bad runtime behavior. Those are things that I think need to be caught. And there's several examples of what bad runtime behavior could be, including not just network activity that I just um, gave an example of, but it could be files that are being touched in slash 10 or libraries being loaded from uh, some, from unwanted uh, folder structures in your, uh, in your um, operating system, so on and so forth. Um, so, Risky behaviors can happen both in your code as well as you, in your dependencies code. Like if your developers are bringing in third-party OSS components into your code and they could be having uh, risky behaviors. Uh, and it's runtime observability is important for apps like not just to identify these risky behaviors at runtime, but also to correlate with the findings of your static scanners so that you can prioritize which of the findings of the static scanners are actually being observed by your application at runtime so that you can figure out which ones to fix first. So it'll help you reduce the alert volume as well as increase coverage of your application security posture. Now, why is observability a must have for cloud native applications? Because cloud native applications increase the order of complexity quite a bit. Um, come to think of it, um, the moment you've granularized your application and divided that into a bunch of microservices, a lot of these microservices in many organizations are managed by different teams. So they may have different base, op base operating system images. One could be using Alpine, one could be using Ubuntu and, and Red Hat and so on and so forth. Um, the, not only the base images, but the languages used by these um, applicate for these, each of these microservices might be different. One could be written in Golang, one could be written in Java or Node.js. So there's a larger surface area of risk. Um, and, and therefore you need to make sure that you observe each of these um, running containers while they are in action, as opposed to just scanning your container image when it's sitting in a repo, uh, repository. So um, just the uh, you know, quick scan of your repos is insufficient. You need to make sure that you look at it at runtime. So now that we've established what observability is and why it's an emerging technology trend, let's talk about what observability can do to the list of AppSec findings that Andrew laid out before. So this was a slide that Andrew laid out. It basically says, these are the tools that exist in the market today. And there's probably one tool uh, for each of these uh, you know, boxes that you might be using in your organization. Now the question is, obviously we don't wanna use all of that. We wanna make sure that we have a unified view. And what is it that unifies uh, you know, some of these things? It's, uh, it, observability is, is a fantastic candidate to unify that. So if you overlay observability on top of these tools, whether that's whether you use multiple tools or whether you use one tool like a deep factor that, that incorporates observability uh, along with some of these other modules so that you get, get, get that unified experience. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a way to, to augment both runtime dynamic and static findings. So here's, how, here's, here's what it can do for you. Right. On the runtime side, observability will give you visibility into your application's behavior by looking inside the app while it is running. There are several ways to incorporate observability. If you use, uh, you know, tools like, uh, you know, Sysdig, it's an agent that you put on the host. If you use a tool like Aqua, it's a sidecar that you install in your Kubernetes environment. If you use a tool like DeepFactor, it's a library that you drop into your, uh, at using a Kube uh, plugin. So all of them have their own place and pluses and minuses. And um, on the operator side, tools like Sysdig and Aqua are probably the better fit if you are using production rollouts and you want your goal is to secure your production environment. But on the development side, tools like DeepFactor are the better fit because you need your goal is to identify 
runtime behavior that's happening in every thread, every process, every container in every pod of your Kubernetes deployment, for example. Um, so you need something that watches each of these processes as opposed to a sidecar that is observing it from the outside. So observability, depending on how it's delivered, can give you great visibility into runtime uh, of the application, but also make sure that you pick a tool that, uh, that condenses all of these insights into a small number of actionable uh, items as opposed to just overwhelming you with a ton of telemetry, because that's not what you, um, you know, what, what you want uh, in, is you, you don't want yet another tool that spits out a ton of alerts. You want a tool that reduces and detects anomalies based on these alerts and, and, and reduces them into a handful of actionable items. The second advantage that you get, or second thing that, that uh, a good observability platform can do for you is to augment your DAST. A lot of the times, DAST is kind of like a standalone thing that you run, uh, you know, once a week or or once a month, or sometimes in, in mostly in pre-prod, sometimes even in prod, um, to poke the application from the outside and then detect vulnerabilities like the OWASP top ten type vulnerabilities. And examples of DAST tools are OWASP uh, Zap, which is what we use uh, integrated into Deep Factor, but we also uh, see a lot of the, you know, Burp Suite and Acunetics and Neuralesion and Stackhawk and all of these companies that are, that are uh, that that provide DAS tools. The beauty of combining observability with DAS. In fact, I just gave a talk on uh, Friday at the OWASP, OWASP uh, conference um, on specifically that topic. Is how do you enrich your DAS by combining it with observability? Uh, using just to shorten it a bit. The, by, by using um, the ability to observe an app from the inside, you actually can get to detect things like, hey, my app was listening on web services XYZ. And you can use that um, information to pass back along to your Zap scanner so that your, your DAS scanner can, can therefore scan these new interfaces. Uh, you can also identify um, uh, which changes have happened between releases so that um, you know, your uh, DAS scanner is not now going and scanning every endpoint or crawling every API of your application and scanning it by going through your Swagger document. It only scans the, the list of changes, which reduces the scan times for, for DAS, which is one of the biggest uh, pain points uh, that DAS, Zap scans or DAS scans in general take a lot of time. So lots of benefits by combining observability with uh, a DAS uh, product. Now let's come all the way to the left, which is what can observability do in the context of your software compos composition analysis or your artifact scanners? Uh, again, um, I may have touched upon it uh, two slides ago, which is the ability to prioritize your insights um, by uh, that, that your SCA tools or your container image scanning tools provide you by correlating it with runtime context is something that observability can do. So in a nutshell, there, there's so many different tools out there. A good way to think about it is unify them, but you can't just, unification is not just throwing all these tools into one pane of glass. It is actually combining it with a technology such as observability to give you deep insights and help you augment your existing tooling uh, and reduce the, the number of things that your developers have to fix at the end of the day. So we talked about the, the evolution of apps, like apps uh, into cloud native, work, uh, cloud native workloads. We talked about the, uh, that resulting in a, the need for a modern AppSec like platform. Uh, but let's take a step back and uh, in a kind of unvendor related way, talk about what is the right thing to do when you're planning for your AppSec like strategy. So let's start with um, the first thing that you know, we typically recommend uh, you know, any organization to do that's embarking upon this journey of, hey, I want to put AppSec in place is understand your business driver. You know, is, is the need for my, for my AppSec journey a digital transformation? Is it application modernization? Or do I just want something in the CI pipeline? Or am I just trying to get some compliance boxes checked uh, you know, with Biden's executive order around bill of materials as well and so forth? Once you understand that, then you understand, you know, what, uh, who is going to be using the tool? I mean, do we have resources, a dedicated AppSec team that is going to be doing this task, in which case they will be doing the tool selection and embedding into the CI pipeline, and then the developers are going to be consuming it? Or do I, it, does it have to be done uh, as part of the engineering organization? If so, identify a resource. Some, you know, essentially, you need a resource to put the tool in place. You need uh, a process and a resource for, that, uh, for the alerts to be regularly triaged. Because um, without an understanding of the proper process, that program is going to not be successful. So you want to make sure that you give some thought to it. And then uh, you figure out what your, uh, before you pick the right tool, you know, understand what your technology requirements are. If your app is a monolithic application that is written in .NET, you know, you, might, you may want to use a, an older kind of IS, IS tool coupled with uh, maybe some DAST and maybe some code scanners. 
But if you're building a modern cloud native application, uh, then consider a cloud native application security tool. Uh, if you're building a mobile application, then you need some, uh, you know, a, a mobile, uh, you know, uh, security tools like Now Secure and stuff like that are, are, are good for that. Uh, and once you've done that, then you understand, you know, what budgets and timelines, uh, you know, make sense for you. The beautiful thing about picking tools that offer more than one functionality into one unified experience is that you save a lot on money, as well as the time it takes to set up these tools. So pay attention to that. Uh, as part of your budget. And then make sure that you dedicate uh, a certain amount of time. There are certain tools that take a long time to uh, to put in place. It's not just the aspect of baking the tool in, it's, it's the aspect of getting your engineering team to kind of work with your security person or the AppSec team to get the, the triaging process kind of nailed down completely. So that takes a little bit of time to so do maybe a trial, uh, uh, trial run with a couple of year sprints and then uh, you know get that incorporated in the long term as well. Great, great, great summary. Uh, there, Karen. Um, so, so you know, just as we go ahead and close out this webinar, um, you know, I wanted to bring you guys um, attention to some resources uh, that you can follow up with if you uh, want to learn a little bit more about observability and DevSec DevSecOps maturity. Um, we do have a couple of blogs that we've written. I, I think Karen wrote maybe both of these actually. Um, so, so there are a couple of good blogs about what is observability, um, a little bit more on why it matters for AppSec, uh, and then a whole another blog on DevSecOps maturity and, and what sort of decision points and sort of things that enterprises need to consider as they sort of make their way through that DevSecOps maturity, uh, you know, stage step ladder that we talked about earlier. Um, we also, you know, if you're interested in learning more about Deep Factor, um, we do have some, some case studies that have been done by um, some of our customers. So um, feel free to visit our YouTube page and watch that. Uh, it's pretty, pretty helpful. If anything, um, not just for the deep factor angle, it's it's actually kind of cool to see um, peers that are going through the same sort of challenges that you might be going through and, and, and their thought process to why they might have evaluated, uh, you know, an alternative AppSec tool or, or decided to do something versus, uh, uh, you know, another decision. So it, th that's always a great video to watch. And then finally, if, if you do want to see more about deep factor and, and you would like to see a demo, um, please feel free to, to reach out to us and, and we would love to get on a call with you and, and kind of walk you through uh, through the product. Um, so, you know, unless, unless Kieran, you have anything else to add or Virginia, we missed anything. Um, I think we're, we're kind of, um, at the top of the hour here and, and we maybe have one time for one question. So this, this seems like a good one. Um, so Karen, could you touch a little bit more on, on why existing app sec tools might not work for a cloud native development? I know we kind of talked about it a little bit, but it seems there's two questions in here, um, that seem to be indicating like, well, I have all these tools. I'm confused, you know, why I, I need another one. Yeah, yeah. No, so the question is not needing another one. The question is, as you move from your traditional applications into this new world of cloud native, now is actually, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem to be solved, but it's actually an opportunity to kind of rethink your tool set. Uh, and so it's a good time for you to reimagine what your AppSec tool set should look like for this new world. Um, so instead of taking, you have two choices. I mean, we have choice number one is to take the existing AppSec tools that we've been using all along. Uh, it's like four or five different tools and put them all in this new world. Or choice two is, you know, re, you know leapfrog it and go pick a, pick a tool that understands cloud native, that is designed to understand both the runtime aspects of your containers as well as your static aspects of your containers. Therefore, uh, you can kill two birds with one shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, that, that was, I think that's a great way to end. I think that was ultimately what we were trying to advocate for when we started this presentation an hour ago. Um, so thank you, Karen, for your time. Um, thank you, Virginia, for helping facilitate. And thank you to all of you for tuning in and listening to, uh, to us talk a little bit about AppSec modernization.